while 97% of scientists agree that climate change is real, which is different than saying that global warming is real, by the way, but 97% of scientists agree. And so, and now we're hearing from Dr. Richard Lindzen, and he doesn't agree, but 97% of scientists do, so why the hell should we listen to Dr. Lindzen? There are some issues where I think you could say there was 100% agreement. For instance, if you were to say um, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and adding it will probably create some warming. I don't think too many people would disagree. I think the only thing would be how much, and many people would think it would be negligible. But no one would disagree with that. Given this telephone game, where you can say something perfectly innocent, and the politicians can interpret it as saying, oh, so you agree that we'll have warming. And that warming, however small, you know, they'll assume is the end of the world. Well, yeah, there's agreement. But it's not agreement with what they're ultimately claiming, that it's an existential threat. I'm talking today to Dr. Richard Lindzen. He's an accomplished professor, atmospheric physicist and meteorologist, having authored over 200 scientific papers and contributed to landmark theories in the realm of ozone photochemistry, atmospheric tides, and most recently, climate stability. Holding a rare view in opposition to mainstream science, or perhaps not so rare, Lindzen disagrees on the role of water vapor in current climate change models and argues that alarmism is widespread, aided by political consensus, not unlike the once popular research on eugenics. Dr. Richard Lindzen, is a dynamical meteorologist. He has contributed to the development of theories for the Hadley circulation, hydrodynamic instability theory, internal gravity waves, atmospheric tides, and the quasi-biennial oscillation of the stratosphere. His current research is focused on climate sensitivity, the role of cirrus clouds in climate, and the determination of the tropics to pole temperature difference. His academic degrees are all from Harvard University. He is the recipient of various awards and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Between 83 and 2013, he was the Alfred P. Sloan Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at MIT. He assumed emeritus status as of July of 2013. Prior to 83, he held professorships at the University of Chicago and Harvard University. He's also been a distinguished visiting scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as well as a visiting professor at the Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, the Ecole Normale Supérieure, the University of Paris, and Kyushu University. The first thing we're gonna determine before we dive into the topic at hand is why it might be reasonable and important to listen to Dr. Lindzen. I graduated from Harvard uh, in physics, 1960, so it was a long time ago. I realized at that point that I really enjoyed classical physics and actually modern physics seemed in some ways intimidating. So I continued in graduate work in applied mathematics. Now, Harvard was different from other places in applied math. Places like NYU were very heavy into the theoretical aspects of applied math. Harvard, applied math was solving problems with applied math. And they were heavily into problems in meteorology and other things. And so I ended up doing a thesis that was really atmospheric physics. Uh, it was the interaction of fluid motions and chemistry and radiative transfer, mostly in the stratosphere. And there were a lot of good problems. I enjoyed it. The one problem with it was uh, there was very little experience with data. And so I went for a postdoctoral period 
at the University of Washington, and there was a superb data anal analyst, uh, Dick Reed, who was on the faculty there. He's now deceased. Uh, and after that, I went to Norway for a year, and there was a very able and famous dynamic meteorologist there, uh, Arnta Eliasson. And, and that was also a pleasure. And, and during that time, I began working on some other problems, ranging from tides in the atmosphere to some problem called the quasi-biennial oscillation. Uh, you may not realize it, but the wind over the equator at about 15 kilometers roughly, plus or minus 10, uh, goes from east to west for one year, turns around, goes the other way for another year. The average period is actually about 26 months. And that had been a puzzle. And um, we managed to find a solution to that puzzle as to how that worked. Probably too complicated to explain. It involves, you know, random waves generated by the cumulus clouds in the tropics interacting with the flow and forming something that essentially would be called a relaxation oscillator. And that's actually held up pretty well um, for almost 50 years or 60 years. So as theories go, that did well. There was also a, a problem with tides. I mean, people familiar with tides in the ocean know that they're primarily 12-hour lunar tides. And they're lunar tides because the moon, although much less massive than the sun, is so close that its perturbation to the gravitational potential is greater than that of the sun. But then it was observed that in the pressure at the surface in the Earth, the tides were also primarily semi-diurnal, that is, say, 12 hours, but solar. And so that was a bit of a puzzle because that had to be thermal. And uh, Lord Kelvin in the 19th century was asking, you know, given that the 24-hour component was much stronger, why was it 12 hours? And he suggested the atmosphere was resonant at 12 hours. And that actually dominated the literature until the late 50s. And Resonant, turn, meaning what? Meaning, you know, let's say you have a, uh, oh, a violin or something. You stroke and you get a certain note. That's because it's resonant at that note. It right. displays that. It vibrates at yeah. that note. And so people had figured out, you know, how it might be resonant and so on. But after World War II, when one had rockets, one realized the atmosphere was not the way it had to be, to be resonant. And we figured out why the 24-hour got trapped. And so that was kind of fun. It was problems like that, that make, in some ways, atmospheric science, meteorology, geology, geophysics, kind of fun. It's, it, they're great fields. Mm -hmm. I went to the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and um, I was a staff scientist there. And uh, there was a sort of reason for it. It was slightly cynical. Um, some of my classmates had gone into academia, and I was watching it. 